So today was always meant to be an FAQ, but I was going to be doing a different FAQ today on this day. And I changed my mind at the very last minute as a result of yesterday's video. So that's fun and cool and wild. And I will tell you more about the FAQ, why I changed my mind, and all of the things in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for day 315 of 365 days of soap, and today, as I said, is an FAQ. And I decided to change this to this specific topic, or topics, really, as a result of yesterday's video, because I got loads of questions and comments from you, the Sudzers, from yesterday's video about the solvents and appropriate substitutions and crystallization and cure and bluing, really. And so that's really what we are going to do. We are going to dedicate one video to answering those questions because I did get really into it yesterday. I got very intense and very fast talky and that can be a lot to keep up with. So I'm gonna try to keep them sort of separate the recipe for the clear melt and pour from yesterday, yesterday, and today, some follow-up questions. So let's get to the video where I will not be making melt and pour, I will be stamping something, but answering your soapy cues. Okay, so a follow-up FAQ from yesterday's uh, video, wherein we made the final batch of melt and pour, maybe not the final clear, you know, soap, but you know, the third, and I explained, you know, why the solvents work, why they're important, and, you know, what that sort of does to the, well, you know, crystallization of soap, which is, you know, cure, whatever, and just an easy way for soapers to understand what that process is. Uh, without getting too far into the esters and what it actually becomes of an alcohol once it, you know, comes in contact with the fatty acid and saponification or whatnot, I did want to clear a couple things up because I got a load of questions about alternatives to ethanol, you know, like Everclear and whatnot. And I also talked to you about places that you can get ethanol and what you should be looking for in the ethanol that you could potentially pur purchase if you can't find Everclear. We did talk about isopropyl, not the best substitution, but you know, not the worst. And I got a ton of people either saying you can substitute or can I substitute methanol? And the short answer to that is absolutely not. And the long answer to that is, well, A, because the FDA says no, not for a drug, not for a cosmetic. No, 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 no. Why? Because two, it's highly toxic. And it is not only highly toxic, and I mean like highly toxic, three grams of methanol you know, ingested will cause blindness. Any more than that can cause like immediate death. So this is a wildly different beast. While isopropyl alcohol and ethanol both have reactions if ingested, nowhere near methanol. But the second reason why the FDA is like, oh no, no bueno for this. It's not just ingestion. 
it's because it actually absorbs through the skin very easily. Now, in the creation of soap, when you are including an alcohol into your soap solution to make, you know, melt and pour soap, essentially what you're creating is an ester. And, but on, you know, one end of this ester, again, I'm trying not to get into the chemistry weeds. I'm sorry, but a molecule of the alcohol you started with still exists. And so if this is very easy to absorb into the skin and really, really tiny amounts cause blindness and death, highly, highly toxic, absolutely don't put it into your soaps. That is not a good substitution at all for sure. And so we are talking uh, denatured alcohol. Again, you have to pay attention to what's in denatured alcohol to essentially denature it or alter its natural properties, which they do to ethanol to encourage people not to consume them or it will make them violently ill. Now, not all denatured alcohols are created equal. They don't all have methanol in them. An example that is actually pretty good and was a question from one of you was a perfumer's alcohol. And uh, yeah, that actually is fine. It has a chemical in it called uh, Bitrex, I believe, pretty sure. And it's just a really, really bitter solution. So you don't want to drink it. And so that's good. Um, any sort of uh, obviously 100% pure grade ethanol, yes, use it. Food grade ethanol, yes, use it. Uh, your denatured alcohol that you get from Home Depot, no, don't use that. That contains that contains methanol, and that's why it's really very important to if you're not going to, you know get something online from a proper chemical store or use Everclear, really look at the ingredients list, look at the data pages, and make sure that your denatured alcohol, your ethanol blend does not contain methanol. First and foremost, we don't want that. Very, very bad, sir. Okay. Another question that I got was, well, is propylene, essentially is propylene glycol and glycerin the same thing? And no, it's not. It, they are very similar products, but just like with every, you know, thing in the world, it all comes down to chemical composition and one little change in the chemical structure can make a completely different, you know, solution beast chemical thing. So with propylene glycol, I know that they sound similar, but when you have your glycols and your glycerols, the biggest difference between a glycol and a glycerol is the number of OH bonds, well, pairs. And in glycols, you have two. In glycerols, you have three. And for me, I quite prefer glycerin for a number of reasons, but I really like it because it's, you know, very, very safe. Vegetable glycerin is, you know, very easy to come by. Does cost a little bit more than propylene glycol, which is why you may have seen that in some of your, you know, skincare cosmetics products before. And according to the FDA, no real problem with that. So you can substitute either or for that, either the propylene glycol or the glycerin when you're making a melt and pour soap base. But glycerin and propylene glycol are not the same thing. They do have similar functions in cosmetics in that they are emollient and humectants and their, their bonds and their chemical reactions reasonably similar, but technically speaking different. So there's that. And I got another question about isopropyl alcohol and whether or not it is safe to use in, you know, these because, well, doesn't that also penetrate the skin barrier? It does, but it's very, very negligible, just like with ethanol, very, very negligible. And the studies have been done over and over again, including one really weird one with like people and their feet in vodka for 10 hours. It was super wild. Anyway, isopropyl alcohol does not go through the skin as easily, and it's not nearly as toxic as methanol. Oh, and another question I got quite a bit is what is bluing? Because I was bluing all of the soaps at the end while talking about something completely different. And so I apologize for that. For those of you who may not know what bluing is, it's 
that technically is essentially using something blue to cancel out yellow, but you can use it with a number of different colors to cancel out essentially what's opposite it on the color wheel ish. And it's all just color theory, which is kind of, I mean, not kind of, it was literally what I was doing when I was showing you the, you know, bluing of all of the clear soaps that we have made in these three soap recipe things from Melton Pour, trying to remove some of the yellowing of one of the first batches. And then also just playing with purple because I saw a TikTok where somebody had stripped the yellowing from hair by using a purple bleach. And I thought that that was cool and I wanted to try it because really I've usually just used blue to make transparent soap more clear. And a little goes a long way with that. So what I was using in that process was a lab color from uh, Brambleberry, which is a very, very potent uh, colorant and you dilute it with distilled water and you use just a little bit at a time and it's supposed to clear up your yellowing or any sort of cloudiness in your clear melton pour soaps. I have tried it before. I always have a very heavy hand with that and so it usually ends up going more blue than clear but also clear and blue sort of go together better anyway than like yellow and clear, right? Because you think blue, you think water, you get it. But yeah, so that's really the process and something that you can definitely do with all of your clear things. You can do that with all kinds of things, actually. I went down this weird rabbit hole of TikToks where they were using just the color wheel and color th theory to cancel out one color using its sort of opposite color essentially and it's super wild and a lot of fun and definitely something that artistic brains sort of just get right off the bat i don't get that and so i was taught that trick by i don't know i i want to say it was you know when i was a child and it was trying to get rid of like yellow stains on a white undershirt i think that's where i was taught it i don't know but yeah, so that's the process. And that's really kind of as simple as bluing is. To the yellowing of a soap, if your soap has gone a little bit yellow with your cold process or your melt and pour base, it's honestly not the end of the world. As I talked about in yesterday's video, a lot of us that don't actually do melt and pour all of the time, just use it for like embeds and stuff. And most of the time we tint our clear cold process to, or our clear mountain pour to be something else. So getting a crystal clear batch of glycerin soap is not super necessary for most purposes. That said, it, it really is very fun to try and it's a huge accomplishment and a big success and you feel great about yourself when you, don't, you do finally get that super clear batch. So, you know, play around if you're interested. And also, so I got tons of requests, and I have done, for a video explaining or showing or giving a recipe for how to make uh, glycerin soap out of soap paste. And I don't know that I need to give you that, that, that video, because that's basically what I've been doing for the past three, you know, melt and pour transparent soap video things, because that's what you do. You are creating a soap paste and then you are adding stuff to it to make it into a mountain pour base. So literally just the last soap paste recipe I gave you, just take that and measure out, you know, whatever, say five grams, and then use the same solvent, you know, ratios that I have in the recipes I've been giving you for your glycerin and your sugar water and your, you know, alcohol and go from there. Heat up your soap paste in your crock pot, add your solvents, get that nice and hot, 170, 180 degrees, make sure everything is dissolved in there, give it a good mixy mix, and you are, I mean, basically just follow the latter part of all of these videos, and you're golden. You've just made glycerin soap from soap paste. 
So there's that. Also to that, to the actual, you know, ratios that I've given you for the alcohol and the sugar water and the glycerin, those are just guidelines. The, those are ratios that I found work really well for me that I'm happy with, but that doesn't mean that that that's what you have to do. Uh, it, again, I would recommend if you're actually very interested in really formulating cool different recipes for melt and pour, I would recommend picking up Making Transparent Soap by Catherine Faylor because she has loads of different recipes, but also she has really good guidelines in her book about, you know, the, the ratios and kind of the percentages that you should use your solvents in. I violate all of those completely with this particular recipe, but that's okay. Her book was a very great starting point for learning how to make a transparent soap, you know, from scratch. So again, if you're interested in the creation, because it's a very fascinating, very cool field of soapy study that I don't think a lot of people are really doing, you should pick up that book. That will be very, very helpful. And also a book that you should pick up in addition is of course, The Scientific Soap Making by Kevin Dunn. Because Everything that Catherine Faylor, everything that any soap making book is going to say about the process of soap and saponification and cure and whatever can be fact checked and given. You get real actual experiments in Kevin's book. And, you know, it's, it's actually a very cool book in that he encourages you to do the experiments. Do your own research and come up with your own experiments, run your own tests, because that's how you ultimately gain knowledge and, you know, essentially up your soapy game. And so if you're interested in the soap chemistry, definitely pick up the book, Failor, or the one by Kevin Dunn. Either way, both would be great. I cannot rec recommend either one of those books enough. They are amazing. But for the rest of it, yeah, if all you take away from this is don't use methanol in your uh, melt and pour soap, then I have accomplished my real goal for the day. That is day 315. And there it is, a uh, FAQ on all things solvents and bluing and weird stuff that you can put into soap, why the solvents work and you know, all the things. So I hope that, you know, cleared some stuff up for, for you guys. It's a very interesting subject, so I get why there's so many questions, because it's not one that's really covered a lot, the making of the melt and pour from scratch. And so I get it. And I'm always happy to answer any questions for my sudsers at all times, but sometimes there are so many that it actually makes more sense just to put a video out there, because the non-sudsers might be having the same questions. So there's that. Um, I really appreciate you guys for being here for yesterday's fun, for today's fun, for every day's fun. Daily content is fun and a lot of work and awesome. And you guys make it even more awesome by existing in the sphere and being part of the Sudzer family. If you are interested in being part of the Sudzer family, you know, click the button, subscribe. It's free, helps me out big, awesome, whatever. For all the rest of you that have, hey, you are awesome. You help me out every day in more ways than just hitting subscribe. And I think you all know that. And I appreciate you oh so very much. I am out of here for today. I actually need to get this, you know, edited and out to you. And I normally don't cut it this close to the wire, but I will see all of you guys again tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun. Bye.